Asia about a rise in COVID-19 cases driven by the spread of a new coronavirus variant dubbed Arcturus. And the WHO has said it is keeping an eye on the issue. Now, over in Europe, government officials are also on guard against future pandemics. The EU's Health Emergency Preparedness Authority, or HERA, has been in operation since last year. And its goal is to ensure the timely development, production and distribution of medicines, vaccines, along with medical equipment such as masks and gloves. And joining us now live in the studio to talk about this is HERA's Director General Pierre Delso. Well, welcome to uh, Mao Studio, uh, Mr. Delso. Now, there were many lessons that were learned during the pandemic. And um, clearly, you know, there were some missteps and, you know, there were some things that were done well, some not so well. What was your biggest takeaway from the pandemic? I, mean, I believe you said it in your introduction. The first takeaway is the fact that we live in a global world. So something which is happening in one part of the world can have an influence everywhere in the world. And we think something we cannot ignore. Maybe the second message and the second lesson is that nobody was really ready for such a crisis. Mm -hmm. And we need to be uh, aware of the situation and we need to take that also as a lesson for the future. Mm -hmm. And maybe the third message, that the solution was a collective one. And it's by working together, you know, at EU level, but also globally with the rest of the world that we've been able to, to go out of the crisis. And I believe this is, this is also a very important lesson for the future. We need to continue this work collectively, working together everywhere in the world to try to address a future crisis. Because, I mean, as you know, one of the key criticisms was, was that EU response was fragmented. You know, the response was slow. Um, in terms of trying to unify the strategy across EU countries, just how challenging was it and what was happening, you know, behind closed doors? You know, Europe is not very good maybe in communication terms. Let's be very clear. But if you look at the facts, in terms of vaccines available in Europe, vaccines were available in Europe at the same time as anywhere else in the world. Actually, same time as Singapore, same time as other parts of the world. So we were not behind them, first element. Second element, we were able to work together, 27 countries working together, deciding together to purchase vaccines. And also, which is something I would like really to insist on, there was never a selfish attitude from those member states. Everybody was willing also to share those vaccines with the rest of the world. And that was from the start. It was clear that we would be buying vaccines, not only for Europe, but also for the rest of the world. And we have done it. But having said that, uh, Mr. Delso, you know, WHO, they have said that there is vaccine um, inequality across, you know, um, the developing worlds, that, that, you know, that there was this, this mindset of hoarding the vaccines as well. Now, you know, I don't look at declaration. I looked at facts. And let me give you a few facts. First of all, EU has produced more than 3 billion vaccines during the COVID crisis. Two thirds of those vaccines have been exported outside of the EU. Only in the Asia Pacific regions, more than 1 billion vaccines have been exported to the region. We never decided to stop those exportations. And if you look around, if you look at, you know, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, most of the vaccines which were uh, distributed and injected by in those countries were coming from the EU. We never, never stop. And now if I look at the poor countries in the world, again, we need to have the, you know, the facts straight. And let me give you two elements which I believe were extremely important. The first element was the fact that collectively, rich countries decided to create an organization which is called COVAX, which was there to help uh, you know, poor countries to get access to the vaccines. The largest funding came from the EU. So we give more than 4 billion euro, uh, euro to this uh, uh, organization. That's the first element. But the second element, and it's not known, but collectively, the EU countries and the, and the European Commission distributed more than 500 million vaccines to the rest of the world. When I say to the rest of the world, I mean to the poor country in the rest of the world. Mm. We have been the largest donors of vaccines from all the uh, richest countries. And that's something which is not necessarily so well known, but that's a fact and you can look at the figures. Mm. And again, at one point, I can tell you now, we are still willing to give those vaccines. You were referring to the fact that we might have new variants. The EU and the EU countries are still willing to give new vaccines. And actually, we have the possibility to give new adapted vaccines, which are, you know, the new version of the vaccines. We have them in quantities. And I can tell you officially that we are willing to give those vaccines to whoever country would like to get it. Of course, if we are talking about poor and lower income countries. Mm. Now, we've got 
a war in our midst. Well, we're not sure when is it going to end. Um, in terms of trying to make that balance between health security versus uh, EU security and trying to balance those financial uh, commitments, which, you know, some big decisions have to be made there, how do you pr prioritize in such situations? I don't believe you need priority. Of course, we have to address the issue of the war which is taking place in Ukraine and which is taking place on the European soil and all its consequences. But let's be clear, the cost of a health crisis is huge. And we know one thing for sure, there will be a new health crisis in the future. We don't know when exactly, but there will be one in the future. So we need to continue the preparation. We need to continue to invest in health security because that would be important one day. Mm. And as I can tell you from a EU point of view, we have a relatively large budget that we want to continue to use and we want to continue to spend just to be simply better prepared for the next crisis. And what is that number we're looking at? We are talking at about a budget of more than one billion a year, which will continue to be invested only by the European Commission. Mm. Plus, of course, what uh, amounts which are invested by the member states themselves, so by the countries belonging to the European Union. Mm. And in terms of um, trying to, you know, stimulate research, you know, for whether it's the next drug, the next vaccine or the next uh, therapeutic uh, sort of solution on the market, I mean, how is, how is Harry going to drive this? As I told you, we have a budget and part of this budget will be used actually to just to try to stimulate this kind of new vaccines, therapeutics, whatever will be needed. Mm -hmm. But something which also is extremely important for us as ERA, we don't believe we should do it in isolation. I told you one of the lessons of the COVID crisis is the fact that we live in a global world. So if we want to find the solution, if we want to find these uh, stimulating new vaccines, new uh, therapeutics and so on, we need to work collectively. We need to work with the rest of the world. So our vision is simply we don't want to protect Europe. We want to protect the world because by protecting the world, we protect Europe too. And that's why you are in Singapore. You've had discussions with um, um, some of the health officials and other uh, partners here. I'm just wondering what are some of the areas of uh, collaboration you, know, you are um, doing with, with Asia and obviously including Singapore? Now, we are in Singapore because we believe Singapore, of course, is a very important country in this context, but it's also the door to the Asian countries. You know, we know the relationship with uh, Singapore with the rest of the Asian countries. And we believe it's important, actually, that we try to build concrete projects of cooperation. Let me give you a very simple example, but which could be very important in the future. Monitoring wastewater of planes could be a very good way to try to know whether a, a new virus, a new virus, virus is arriving or not. You were mentioning, at the, you know, at one point what's happening in some part of the world, you know, maybe new variants of uh, COVID which might exist. You know, monitoring what's happening uh, through wastewater of the planes could be a very good tool to do it. So as ERA, we are willing to try to, to work with other parts of the world to try to develop this kind of technology, for instance. Well, very much. Uh, thanks for your time, uh, Mr. Delso. We certainly uh, gotten a big, a good idea what um, HERA will be doing uh, um, in the future. Thank you very much for your time. And I was just talking much. to Pierre Delso, Director General for HERA.